You look at what the Russians are doing militarily in Ukraine at the moment. It does not look like they're bent on conquering the country and occupying it and integrating it into a greater Russia. But anyway, here we are. And I think everybody is very interested in the question of where we go from here. So let me say a few words about that. First of all, let me start with U.S. policy. U.S. policy is to double down. That's what we're going to do. This is what we did after 2014. Instead of reevaluating and saying maybe NATO expansion is not such a good idea, we went in the opposite direction. This is why I'm telling you that by 2021, the Russians understood that we were turning Ukraine into a de facto member of NATO. They understood that. Uh, so what we did after 2014, is double down and what we're going to do now and what we're doing now is doubling down. And what does that mean? We're encouraging the Ukrainians to resist. We're not going to fight for them, you understand. We're going to fight to the last Ukrainian, but we're not going to do any of the fighting. They're on their own in that regard. But we're going to arm them and do what we can to train them at this late date and hope that they can hang in there uh, and uh, and duke it out with the Russians. And nobody believes they're going to defeat the Russians, but maybe you'll get a stalemate. Now, the question you have to ask yourself, this is really the key question, is what are the Russians going to do, right? Uh, it seems to me that a lot of people in the West think that uh, if the Ukrainians provide enough resistance, the Russians will roll over and play dead. Uh, or maybe Vladimir Putin will throw his hands up, he'll surrender, he'll say, this was all a bad idea, uh, I regret doing it. Uh, or maybe there'll be a coup in Moscow, he'll be overthrown, and they'll bring in leaders who will work out a deal with us, and Ukraine will live happily ever after, we will live happily ever after, and the Russians will be chastened. I've spent my entire adult life studying great power politics. I know a lot about great power politics. This is not the way the world works, and it is certainly not the way the Russians work. You want to understand, going back to what I said about the April 2008 decision, the Russians said at the time, this is an existential threat. This is an existential threat, right? So even before the current war, Ukraine, and Ukraine becoming part of NATO was viewed as an existential threat. Now you're talking about a situation where you defeat the Russians in Ukraine. This is a much worse outcome for the Russians than what happened in April 2008, and a much worse outcome than what happened in February 2014. And the Russians are not going to roll over and play dead. In fact, what the Russians are going to do is they're going to crush the Ukrainians. They're going to bring out the big guns. They're going to turn places like Kiev and other cities in Ukraine into rubble. They're going to do Fallujahs. They're going to do Mosul's. They're going to do Grozny's. You know what happened in World War II when the United States was faced with the possibility of having to invade the Japanese home islands in early 1945. The idea of invading the Japanese home islands after what happened at Iwo Jima and then later what happened in Okinawa really spooked us. So you know what we did? We decided to burn Japanese cities to the ground starting on March 10th, 1945. We killed more people the first night we firebombed Tokyo than we killed at either Hiroshima or Nagasaki. And we were systematically burning Japanese cities to the ground. Why? Because we did not want to invade the Japanese main islands. When a great power feels threatened, when it, the Russians are going to pull out all stops in Ukraine to make sure that they win. And then there's the nuclear dimension to this. The Russians have already put their nuclear weapons on high alert. This is a really significant development because what they were doing was sending us a very powerful signal as to how seriously they take this crisis and what's going on. So again, if we start winning and the Russians start losing, you want to understand that what we're talking about doing here is backing a nuclear-armed great power 
that sees what's happening as an existential threat into a corner. This is really dangerous. Go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis. I don't think that what happened in the Cuban, Cuban Missile Crisis was as threatening to us as this situation is to the Russians. But if you go back and look at how American decision makers thought at the time, they were scared stiff. They thought that Soviet missiles in Cuba was an existential threat. And they were willing, many of Kennedy's advisors, to use our nuclear arsenal against the Soviet Union. That's how serious great powers get when they think they face existential threats. So in my opinion, we are in a very dangerous situation. I think the likelihood of nuclear war is very small, but the likelihood doesn't have to be high for me to be really scared because of the consequences associated with nuclear use. So we better be extremely careful here regarding what we do in terms of pushing the Russians into the corner. But again, I'm not sure that's going to happen because I think what's going to happen here is that in a competition between us and the Russians, the Russians will win. Now you're saying to yourself, why is he saying that? I think that if you uh, think about this, you want to think about who has the greater resolve, right? Who, who really cares more about this situation, the Russians or the Americans? The Americans do not care that much about Ukraine. The Americans have made it clear they are not even willing to fight and die for Ukraine. So it's not that important to us. For the Russians, they have made it clear it's an existential threat. So the balance of resolve, I believe, favors them. So as we walk up the escalation ladder moving forward, my guess, and it's just my guess, is that the Russians will prevail, not the Americans, and the Russians will prevail because the balance of resolve favors them. Now, the question is, who loses this war? Uh, I think it doesn't matter much to the United States if we lose in the sense that the Russians prevail in Ukraine. I think the real losers in this war are the Ukrainians. And I think what's happened here is we have led the Ukrainians down the primrose path. We have pushed very hard to encourage the Ukrainians to want to become part of NATO. We have pushed very hard to make them part of NATO. We have pushed very hard to make them a Western bulwark on Russia's borders, despite the fact the Russians made it clear that this was unacceptable to them. We, in effect, and here I'm talking about the West, we took a stick and we poked the bear in the eye. And as you all know, if you take a stick and you poke a bear in the eye, that bear is probably not going to smile and laugh at what you're doing. That bear is probably going to fight back. And that's exactly what's happening here. And that bear is going to tear apart Ukraine. That bear is in the process of tearing apart Ukraine. And again, we go back to where we started. Who bears responsibility for this? Do the Russians bear responsibility for this? I don't think so. There's no question the Russians are doing the dirty work. I don't want to make light of that fact. But the question is, what caused the Russians to do this? And in my opinion, the answer is very simple. The United States of America. Thank you.